Here we go. I see the opening slide and I've got one o'clock exactly Eastern time. So we're going to get started. Welcome to the 2020 uh, Better Buildings, Better Plants Summit, a virtual leadership symposium this year. Let's go to the next slide. And I want to thank you all for being with us here today. This is the education sector meetup. We have a wonderful session prepared uh, and some fantastic speakers we're gonna introduce in just a moment. Let's go to the next slide. I am your moderator. My name is Nate Allen. I recently joined the Weatherization and Intergovernmental Programs Office at DOE, uh, where I now lead the K-12 sector. Prior to this, I was in DOE's Building Technologies Office as a fellow where I um, managed the higher education sector and healthcare and hospitality. Uh, and I am presently covering for my colleague Hannah Debelius, who many of you know serves as DOE's higher education sector lead. She will be co-moderating with me later on in this session, uh, but I wanted to make sure to introduce her early on at the beginning here. Presently, she's in the commercial real estate meetup, um, and she's going to be facilitating the Q&A towards the end of the time we have together here. Before we move on, I want to also recommend my, uh, or recognize my colleague, Brooke Holloman, who worked with many of you over the last year in the K-12 sector uh, and has been doing a fantastic job in our work with state and local districts, state, uh, state and local entities and K-12 schools um, and uh, has been a, a great help to me during my transition. So thank you, Brooke. Let's keep moving to the next slide here about our agenda. I want to go through a quick rundown of how this is going to work for our time together. We've got some housekeeping items and some introductory notes just to cover briefly at the beginning here. Then I wanna get into um, an overview uh, of the sectors, so K-12 and higher education. We're gonna talk a bit about the priorities, uh, key activities that we're seeking to address this year, some resources that we're publishing um, and that are upcoming. Uh, that'll be quick. I'm gonna run quick, uh, very talk, talk very uh, speedily at that point, um, but don't worry. the slides will be made available to you later. And I have a, another note on that in just a sec. Um, I'm doing that because I wanna make sure we have time to hear from our experts. So we have uh, some fantastic leaders from across the education sector who are joining us today. I'll introduce them momentarily. Um, and they've each prepared a presentation and are eager for your Q and A. Uh, so I wanna make sure we leave a lot of time for that, uh, which is how we will then conclude uh, the session we have today. So I mentioned all of these slides, let's go to the next one. All these slides will be made uh, available to you. Um, we're also seeking to make sure we have a way to continue engaging throughout the rest of the week, but during this hour. So one of the ways that we're looking to do that is through social media. Here are our hashtags. You can find out more information uh, by pursuing that channel. Um, let's go to the next slide on housekeeping because before we dive in here, there are a few points I want to cover. Uh, so the first thing is to note that this session is being recorded and it will be archived on the Better Buildings Solution Center. Uh, we will follow up with all of you when the recording and the slides are made available. Uh, next, as attendees, uh, you each have the option to share your video uh, as well as unmute yourself. Now that said, um, we ask that you keep yourselves muted when you're not speaking to avoid background noise. I'm sure you all have gotten really good at webinars lately. Um, but if you experience any issues uh, with AV, let's use the Zoom chat window. So you'll see that in the bottom of the Zoom panel. You can scroll your cursor over. Let's use that for AV issues. Now for interactive, uh, to make this session interactive, let's go to the next slide here. We are committed to finding ways to make sure that this dialogue can occur through this virtual format. So we're really excited today to use this Slido platform uh, for Q&A and polling. Many of you probably just saw it in the opening plenary. Uh, we're gonna do a test here in a sec. Uh, if you want, while I'm speaking, to go to slido.com and uh, log into the education sector meetup. The instructions are on the screen here. I'll talk you through it. But the other thing you can do, we've put the QR code on this slide and uh, it works on my phone. If I hold my phone up, my, the camera, it pulls right up. Uh, so you can try that or you can go to slido.com and enter in the hashtag BB Summit. And then in the drop down menu, uh, you'll see education meetup. Um, 
And that's what the, the engagement channel that we'll use to conduct that polling. Hear your Q&A, please submit Q&A throughout the session because that will be where we'll aggregate it uh, and use to help guide our discussion at the end uh, and so forth. So I'm gonna give you all a few minutes more just to open up Slido. Hopefully you're, you're getting there or almost there. And let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna make sure I get my Slido up too. Let's go to the next slide and we'll just start out with a quick test. So um, where are you joining us from today? So if I was answering this question, I would say Washington DC. And let's, uh, let's do a test to see how well this works. Here we go. Well, Denver's got a strong showing in this word cloud. Very good. Okay, these are gonna filter in. This is useful for us just to have as well um, after the fact when we do some analysis on this session. So thank you all for contributing. And don't worry if you see your city name not in the largest of fonts. The ticker is still clicking up, but we've got a strong turnout from Denver. All right, way to go. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to suggest that we go to the next Slido question, if we go to the next slide. Okay, so yeah, here we're interested in understanding more about who's in the room. So if you can take a moment to answer this response. Well, I'm not surprised to see that top bar go out like that, okay. <laughs> Energy and utilities, these are the top two. Yeah, facilities, great. Okay, management finance, uh-huh. Okay, so we've got a pretty even spread there between sustainability and resilience focused individuals along with energy and utilities, facilities and infrastructure. And I understand that some of you uh, wear, are, are in positions where you wear lots of hats. Uh, and so sometimes these polls are challenging to answer, but it's useful for us to know just as a, at a high level uh, what types of attendees we have today. So this is great, thank you very much. Let's go to the next slide. What we're gonna do here now is transition, I'm gonna close my slide. Oh, we're gonna transition to a sector overview. I wanna just talk a bit about our work over the past year uh, before we get to our terrific speakers. So if we can go to the next slide, I thought it'd be helpful uh, to start with just where we stand with our partners in both sectors. Uh, so across K-12 and higher ed, we have over 50 partners now that are covering uh, 400 million, more than 400 million square feet across K-12 and higher education institutions. Um, and I think this is really important to highlight because it's because of our work with these partners that our collection of solutions highlighting uh, you know, innovative ways to over overcome barriers continues to grow. This is the value of the voluntary partnership through Better Buildings. Uh, we want the outcomes to broadly benefit the market and we're thrilled to get to work with such a wide array of folks who are so uh, eager to improve their energy but also willing to share what's working with them. Let's go to the next slide uh, where we see our sector priorities. So every year we work with our partners to determine specific goals to address. And these priorities help uh, guide DOE's work in the space and the resources that we publish throughout the year. So listed here, you'll see the 2019 and 2020 priorities for each subsector. And normally at this summit, and Maria alluded to this during the opening plenary a moment ago, uh, we seek input on priorities for the next fiscal year. So that starts for us in September. Uh, and in fact, that's uh, generally what we're listening for in this conversation. These meetups uh, usually happen around round tables and they're very, uh, you know, focused dialogues on what are the specific challenges that you're seeking to address and we listen for ways that we can uh, then try and match uh, expertise or resources that we could help produce to speak to some of those challenges. We're going to do our best to recreate that today. So I want to go to the next slide, which is another Slido poll. We're going to take a minute on this one um, because I'm interested to hear your, in to see your input rather on priorities um, if you can list your challenges just briefly on the screen relating to energy efficiency for the upcoming year, you can list more than one. You can, you can enter on multiple phones. What we're doing right now is a data collection exercise. We're interested in what's on uh, top of mind for you. And let's uh, take a moment to do this and I'll pull up Slido as well. Money, okay. Well, uh, you know, finance usually comes up first. So uh, 
Way to be succinct. Number two does not surprise me. Interesting. Okay, this is good. This is really insightful. This is helpful, y'all. Thank you. Okay. So I'm seeing a lot around financing, a lot about whether schools will be open uh, and how to open, it seems, cost containment, technical expertise. And what we're going to do after this session is group these and try and drill down <clears throat> and distill a little further uh, to see what we can learn from them and how it can help, uh, as I mentioned, uh, influence our work together in the time ahead. So this is really helpful. Keep, keep entering these if you have more thoughts. I see some longer responses coming in now, which is fabulous. Ventilation COVID, yeah. I hope you all enjoy the opening plenary. A lot more to discuss there, and indeed throughout the week it will come back up as a topic. I'm an advocate, it's difficult to raise these issues with the, yeah, okay. Um, well, in the interest of time, I'm going to continue talking, but please, uh, more thoughts that are top of mind for you, share them with us. This is a great way to give us feedback uh, that I, as I've mentioned, will inform our work together. So uh, let's go to the next slide. We're gonna shift gears slightly, and I want to extend a welcome to the six new partners that joined us this past year. This is really exciting. Uh, each one of these partners uh, is demonstrating leadership by publicly committing to reduce their energy use by 20% over the next 10 years. So welcome to these six partners. We're thrilled to have you in the program. Uh, and we can't wait for you to be goal achievers. Speaking of which, let's go to the next slide. We would like to take a moment to congratulate these five partners on achieving their energy reduction goals this year. So congratulations uh, to these five partners. Um, we have prepared a brief video highlighting uh, the exemplary work, exemplary work that they've done across their districts or across their campuses. Um, I think in the interest of time, we are not going to play it now, but trust that you can access it later on the Solutions Center. We're also gonna share it with the partners so that they can broadcast it as a means of celebrating their success. We wanna do everything we can to recognize our goal achievers. And fortunately, we have representatives from each of these school uh, districts and uh, institutions with us today. And we've asked them to prepare just a very short, uh, greeting that outlines um, maybe one or two strategies at most uh, that they thought were essential and really influential in their ability to achieve their goal, uh, as well as one thing that they're looking forward to moving forward. So we're gonna start uh, with Indianapolis and Scott Martin. And Scott, your audio just worked. How are you doing now? Are you able to, uh, to join us? I am. Wonderful, Scott, take it away. Okay. Hey, yeah, I just I just want to thank uh, the Department of Energy for leading the way for energy savings. Uh, prior to 2016, our district had not done anything on energy, and uh, really for the next two years after joining the Better Buildings Challenge, uh, we, we had only made small incremental uh, change in our use. Uh, we brought Synergistic on board. Uh, in 2018, in two years, we're down 26% in energy usage. And we're, we're uh, so excited about that. We want, to, we want to take it even farther. I'm shooting for uh, another 20% over the next two years of reductions. Well, that's awesome. Uh, kudos to you and congratulations for this milestone. We look forward to uh, seeing what you do next. Way to go, Scott. Uh, let's shift gears next to Anne Arundel County. Zach Lammers, I think you're on the line. We just talked to you. Yes. Zach. yes Wonderful, sir. Zach. Take it away. Uh, I just wanted to share, uh, obviously, uh, uh, our gratitude to the Better Buildings platform. Um, it's been a great resource for us the last several years. Um, the one key takeaway I wanted to highlight, and uh, this has been highlighted many times on various Better Buildings seminars, but it really takes a village, especially for uh, school districts with several buildings, or in our case, we have um, over 125 buildings. Uh, so we've had to really collaborate with the various facilities departments and different stakeholders um, on site as well. So we've uh, really focused on 
from the front end with planning, design, and construction, uh, designing as, as efficient as we possibly can, but then also on the back end with maintenance and operations, we uh, coordinate with them on a daily basis uh, to ensure our buildings operate as efficiently as possible. Something that we're really looking forward to is expanding the goal um, from 20 to 25% uh, since we achieved it ahead of time. Um, but more importantly, I'm, I'm really interested in uh, the persistence of the savings we've achieved. So I think that's uh, quite commonly overlooked. So we're really excited to kind of work on maintaining the savings we've achieved and uh, seeing how we can get to 25% by 2024. Awesome, Zach. Well, kudos for your great work thus far. Congratulations. We're really excited for Anne Arundel and the rest of the district. Uh, let us next go to my old friend Eric Luters at the Parkway School District. Eric, are you with us? Yes, I am. There um, we go. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, again, I'd like that go, it's, it's, a, it's a great program and we've been excited to be able to, to reach our goals. Um, I think one thing that this program allows us to do is to set that, that uh, standardized kind of target, if you will, and having that uh, industry support and backing of showing like this is a manageable target, these are examples, we can achieve that. And we codified those goals within our strategic plan, within our goals within the organization to overall hit that. So um, we took a multifaceted approach that involved a lot of collaboration, everything from uh, identifying resources for efficiency of capital placement, such as the ASHRAE, Advanced Energy Design Guidelines, that's important, uh, as well as retrofits, conservation work, et cetera. I think moving forward, what we wanna make sure is we're doing is we're taking not just achieved goals, but also turning that into policy with, uh, with what those different standards are that we have. So uh, we're excited to continue, uh, continue to improve and, and double our efforts. Well, way to go, Eric. Congratulations. Uh, let's transition now to higher education. Chris Benson is with us with the University of Utah. Chris, are you live? Yeah, thanks, Nate. Take it away. Um, so uh, being very brief, just to give you a quick background. Uh, so I've been at the University of Utah since 2017. Uh, so much of our success in this goal is certainly from uh, the army of individuals before me. I can speak to a few things about what we have uh, think have most contributed to success and where we're headed. Um, so just very quick sense of scale. We've got about 300 buildings, 17 million square feet. Uh, our team's responsible for benchmarking, energy procurement, and leading strategies for carbon neutrality. Um, we're about 1% of all electricity and gas in the state of Utah. Um, so achieving these goals makes a big dent in our uh, local air quality. Uh, but we also know that uh, we've got to share our lessons learned, good and bad, with others to really amplify that impact. And we know that we've got a lot to learn from you all, so I'm excited to, to be here today. Um, uh, so a few things, uh, how did we achieve our goal? Um, one of the biggest contributions for us was actually uh, construction code and design requirements. Um, we have quite a bit of construction going on each year. And as we have gone back through and tracked the performance for the last decade, uh, that seems to be the most significant thing that consistently has reduced um, our energy consumption. We also had many very large scale targeted projects for reduction um, that uh, happy to talk to another time. Um, going forward, uh, we're, we're very much shifting gears uh, focused uh, on operational changes. Um, so some of the things that we are um, spending quite a bit of time and money on right now uh, are focused specifically on carbon neutrality including uh, campus-wide controls, programming, and standardization projects. Uh, we actually expect these are gonna accelerate our progress pretty significantly, and they're relatively low cost. Uh, so these are really about the fundamentals of well-vetted things we know work, um, but focusing on the standardization, the management of those, simplifying how easy it is to use uh, to exactly the prior point about persistence. Um, so uh, excited to follow up another time with more details and, and to listen in on this conversation today. That's awesome, Chris. We will take you up on that offer and I hope we can get you on a webinar soon. Congratulations. And last but certainly not least, uh, Amy Butler from Michigan State University. Amy, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank Wonderful. you so much and it's great to be here. Uh, first of all, our 20 million square feet uh, encompassed over 183 buildings and they're all tied to our power plant. So they're part of our microgrid. So it's really interesting for us to be able to not only have this experience, but also be service a learning tool for others in 
how you can maximize the efficiency within a, within a microgrid. The program was based on uh, a 10 year retro, commi retro commissioning uh, program that we launched back in 2010, 2011. Interestingly enough, that was launched at the same time we were launching an energy transition plan, looking at our greenhouse gas reduction. During that same time frame, we were able to eventually go off of coal. During that same time frame, we also saw an increase in construction of over 5 million square feet as a result of a very successful capital campaign. So we had an awful lot of things going on at the same time on campus. And I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the energy efficiency team that we have that followed this and looked at all the different ways that they could implement different facets of this program to make it work because it was it's the people ultimately that drive the success. When I asked them what was the, they thought the biggest impacts of this program, one of them was the steam trap program where they went through and analyzed and inspected many, many of our steam traps. When we launched the steam trap program in 2010, we were above the industry standard in uh, failed steam traps of over 20%. Our data last year when we reached our goal is down to uh, just over 3%. So you can imagine that is a huge, huge savings for us. One of the other savings that even while uh, we were doing this, we were also able to look at our greenhouse gas reduction and as a result of the ECMs, we've been able to continue to maintain an even reduction of our greenhouse gas, even while adding 5 million square feet. So increasing our size by almost a quarter. So it really does show that uh, energy conservation measures are very critical to the operations of the campus. We were going down the path of setting a new goal uh, when the COVID crisis hit. And currently we are really focused on how do we use and leverage those buildings and the efficiencies and the operations of the buildings to create a safe environment for our students, our faculty and our staff to be able to return to this fall. So we are looking forward to being able to move forward with those. One of the other impacts that I just wanted to mention is that during the course of this energy, camp, energy conservation campaign, we also started embracing uh, energy efficiency standards in our construction codes and design. So as we did build, build new buildings, we were looking with the energy efficiency components already built in. So overall, we're, we're really, really excited to be able to achieve the, this goal. We achieved it uh, almost two years early, and we're looking forward to what the next five years will bring and what our next goals will be. Thank you. Well done, Amy, and well done, all of you. This is a really big deal. Uh, I don't think we can do enough to celebrate your accomplishments, and I just want to say congratulations once again. Uh, and you know, thank you, in addition for your hard work, for sharing so much of it along the journey uh, through the Better Building Solutions Center for the benefit of others. Let us move along here to the next slide. I want to uh, highlight some more activity from this past year and move into some resources that were published. Um, in K-12, we were, this is a great shot here, yeah, we were proud to speak at the 2020 Green Schools Conference and Expo with partners from Pooter School District in Colorado and Tennessee's Energy Efficient School Initiative. Brooke moderated that panel, highlighting some uh, new resources to support rural schools pursuing energy efficiency. Uh, also on the road, let's go to the next slide. We can cover some site visits. One of my favorite part of the, parts of the job at DOE is getting out to visit partners. Uh, and uh, I think when we, there's Maria in the middle there, when we put the Better Buildings brand behind something, uh, we are fortunately able to help garner media attention to recognize exemplary projects. Um, and higher ed visited two superb partners this past year, the University of Virginia and Chesapeake College. Uh, UVA has done a lot of work. Um, we were down there last July, in fact, right after the summit to celebrate 65% um, energy savings and 79% water savings uh, through a pretty comprehensive, obviously, HVAC uh, lighting upgrade. Um, they have a new 2.2 million, uh, million megawatt uh, rooftop solar array. Uh, there's just some fantastic work going down there on down there with students in Charlottesville. Kudos to UVA. We we're really, really proud to get down there. And then uh, 
several months later, uh, Chesapeake College uh, was recognized for a host of accomplishments, uh, including a uh, 1.8 megawatt solar array with a one megawatt battery backup. Um, one of their facilities had 51% energy savings. Uh, it was their health professions and athletic center. Um, they, across their campus, have 43% energy savings now, uh, and they uh, have added the, they have increased the space of their campus, the square footage of, of constructed space on the campus by 20% during that time, during that journey. Uh, so it's really impressive what's been going on at Chesapeake College. Kudos to both of these schools uh, and their teams for outstanding work. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to go back to K-12 and look at some recently published K-12 resources. So I mentioned this uh, uh, webinar is being recorded. Don't worry about taking notes right now. We're going to share these slides. This will all go up on the Solutions Center as well. What I want to draw your attention to here is that uh, we have a a host of new resources that have been published. Here are a couple uh, in K-12. Um, Brooke worked very hard on exploring uh, solutions for rural schools, uh, focusing on energy efficiency technologies and workforce development uh, best practices uh, to assist with recruiting and uh, retaining, crucially, uh, qualified staff. Really excited about these. Let's go to the next slide. We'll cover some higher ed resources. Uh, you will soon hear a lot more about Smart Labs when Rachel speaks uh, and covers this toolkit. So I'm going to gloss over that one, but it's an excellent resource um, that we uh, built in part with the uh, extraordinarily successful model uh, developed by UC Irvine. You'll hear more about that too at the closing plenary when Wendell uh, is speaking on Thursday. Uh, we also published a three-page review of campus energy plans. Uh, that was this fall. We looked at uh, 45, I think it was actually more than that, different plans across the country and uh, tried to highlight innovative practices within each. Um, so we were looking at plans that cover EUI targets for new construction, major re renovations, um, a range of different attributes uh, and tried to sort them accordingly. A lot of work went into that resource. It's one that I'm very excited about uh, and was pleased we could get out the door. Let's go to the next one quickly. Next slide to look at the HVAC resource map. This continues to be uh, one of our most popular resources, which is fabulous. Um, it has been expanded now and includes laboratory systems. Uh, you'll hear more again about this in just a moment when Rachel speaks. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. And uh, this will be my last one on resources. I cannot say enough good things about the Better Buildings Financing Navigator. It continues to be a top resource for our partners who are seeking uh, assistance and understanding around financing solutions, um, whether it be specifically about energy efficiency or renewable energy projects. Uh, it's an extensive resource. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. You'll find a lot about the benefits and drawbacks uh, of various financing options in there. It's also a platform that can be used for connecting with Better Buildings financial allies. These are folks who have voluntarily opted in. They are ready and interested in funding great projects uh, and more. So if you're not familiar with the Financing Navigator, check it out. Uh, and there are some sessions this week that will cover uh, DOE's work in this space, in the financing space specifically. Uh, so more on that. Let us go now to our next slide where we have the privilege to hear from our experts. We're right on time. This is exactly where we want to be in the session. Uh, so these are our partners, um, both uh, from within the DOE family, but as uh, well in the federal family, I should say, and across uh, the network. So today's speakers include, and I'm not going to read their full bios because they are long and these are accomplished folks. Uh, so just forgive me for being brief, but Christos Cresilio is the Director of uh, Architectural Services and Facilities Planning and probably a whole lot else out at LAUSD. He's a fabulous partner. Uh, I worked with him extensively through our Zero Energy Schools Accelerator. I'm thrilled he's uh, such an active K-12 challenge partner uh, and that I'll get to continue my relationship with Christos now through my new role. Really pleased he can speak today. Uh, I'm gonna move right along to Paul Torsellini. Uh, so we're switching over Brendan, I'm coming back to you, don't worry who will talk second, um, who is a principal engineer out at NREL. Uh, Paul is extremely accomplished in this space. You probably know his name. Um, he is the chairman of the Advanced Energy Design Guide uh, effort. He um, was the principal author and chaired the effort for the Zero Energy Advanced Energy Design Guide for Zero Energy Schools that was published about a year and a half and is a 
highly, uh, I think, uh, it's one of the most downloaded resources that I've, I've ever seen uh, from a, a metric standpoint. The, the, the tracking is astounding on that one. Uh, and has authored numerous uh, publications on the topic of zero energy buildings. He will also be speaking tomorrow for those who are interested in going deeper on that topic. I know Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Paul will cover it in his remarks Thursday uh, in the zero energy session. Uh, but we're pleased he can join us today to talk a bit about some of the new work and research taking place in the education sector. Um, speaker number three, Brendan Hall, who is the program manager for Energy Star at EPA, and he uh, helps lead their work to support state and local governments as well as higher education uh partners um he has been just a fabulous collaborator uh over the last several years that we've been working together to try and find synergies support better buildings partners uh and he's a terrific resource so we're excited brendan can join us today he's spoken at the last couple of better building summit if i'm summits if i'm remembering correctly and he's always been highly rated uh so we're thrilled he came back um and then last but certainly not least uh i've already plugged her talk twice rachel romero who is an energy engineer out at NREL, uh, and she's going to cover the, I think, awesome work that has taken place within the Smart, Smart Labs Accelerator and help distill some lessons that are relevant across the education sector. Her bio uh, is equally impressive and long. She has done some outstanding things in her career. We're thrilled she can join us. So without further ado from me, I'm going to suggest that we jump into these presentations. And uh, as a reminder to a mention I made at the beginning, uh, Hannah DeBelius is going to help facilitate uh, some of these transitions and then in the Q&A towards the end of this once she joins us, which will be shortly. So you'll see her pop up on the screen at some point soon. Without further ado from me, Christos, you're up next. Thank you, Nate, and thank you for the uh, kind of words. I really appreciate to be here with this great panel of professionals to present on a very kind topic, resilience. But I want to take a, a quick moment to thank the uh, Department of Energy team for all the work that you do for us. And, and these sessions, I have to say, they're very inspiring, innovative. So I really appreciate bringing all of us together to discuss uh, very current topics that we're facing today. I've also wanted to give a big shout out to my team. Well, I've, I have the privilege to present. The work is done by a, a lot of different individuals that are very dedicated and, and really spend a great amount of time and very passionate about the work that they do. So I want to thank the Lignified team and all the other teams that were able to join us because, again, it's important that this was a virtual summit and they have the opportunity to be able to listen to these presentations live as well. So thanks for that. And I, I, I want them to know that their work is very well appreciated. Can we go to the next slide, please? So today I'm going to be uh, focusing and giving an overview on several items. The first three, I'm just gonna do a quick overview and then we're gonna focus on resiliency as it is the current topic that we're gonna be spending a little bit more time. So next, just to give a perspective in terms of LA Unify, we are the second largest school district in the nation with uh, over 600,000 students. And when you look at the, the amount, the size of the district in terms of real estate, we're probably the largest school district in the nation with over six and a half thousand acres of land. And uh, that is within uh, 72 million square foot of building area and over 1,210 sc uh, schools and centers. Next, our mission, it is to be the most sustainable school district in the nation. And while that's easy to say, that comes with a lot of, a lot of work that has to be accomplished. Next, so the goals that we've uh, set up initially with the Department of Energy uh, a few years ago it was, we set up a benchmark in 2014 and we said by the year 20, um, 2024, we'll be able to reduce energy and water consumption by 20%. But most recently, our uh, Board of Education adopt a new resolution to become 100% clean renewable, uh, to use 100% clean renewable electricity by 2030, and then to be able to become a carbon free district by 2040. So I'll be focusing more, um, as I was mentioning earlier about uh, resiliency and, and how we we'll prepare for the unknown. What we need to be focusing um, in terms of developing that resiliency and what are we focusing now? And then I'll be speaking more specific about those items next and, and understanding what resiliency is and what kind of uh, 
processes we have in place currently and what else we have to be doing to become a more resilient district. Next. And then I wanted to share um, some of the accomplish accomplishments and bottom line as a school district. Next slide, please. So how do we prepare for the unknown? And we know that uh, when we look at the, the last year, um, our weather and climate disasters have increased. While we look at in the East Coast, and, and you're facing with a lot of um, severe thunderstorms, flooding, uh, tornadoes. Here on the West Coast, we're dealing a lot more with fires, earthquakes, and certainly um, uh, most recently that, and have, this is like globally, it is the most recent pandemic that we're facing. And how do we deal with all this? And certainly all these, all these uh, different disasters that we have, they do have something in common. Um, they all disrupt our everyday uh, businesses that we have. So they all uh, create a big impact on our facilities, but also on our resources as well. Next, please. So our uh, sustainability initiatives unit is focused in certain distinct areas. And we chose those areas initially because we wanted to be able to improve sustainable design throughout the district. So we focus on energy and water um, reduction. We look at campus ecology, how we're greening our school campuses. We try to learn more about new technologies and how we can identify new technologies and implement them in our standards. And then we look at high performance schools, how we can make our schools to become more high performance schools in terms of how they plan and design. And certainly we look at our students as uh, on how we can get, uh, uh, or how can we involve them in our processes by providing education and awareness and then make them part of our team so we can increase our impact uh, throughout the entire district not just at the school district, but also in our communities. Next, please. So, but why resiliency? And it's interesting when we look at resiliency and see what it matters, specifically what we're seeing with all these disasters that we have been facing lately. But if I was to define resiliency myself, I would say that is the ability to bounce back from adversity. So it's how we see um, pretty much our resources, our people, systems and how quickly they, come, they can come back from a negative experience. So if we were to kind of look at that in terms of our divine resiliency, I think it's important to understand how we can be able to manage. And there's certain what we define stressor, stressors that we have impact on our facilities, such as our aging infrastructure, um, su such as different things that we see within our buildings, um, how they get impacted. And then we can look at the shocks, which is mostly about the actual events that happen, like an earthquake, a flood, a fire, um, things that we have to respond to. Next slide, please. So I wanted to do a poll to understand what is resiliency to you. And if you can't select what's important to you, I think we'll help to focus a little bit more on the presentation that we have today. So, So if you can use your poll, your slide, or you'll be able to, we'll be able to see what is, what is resiliency to you? And, and certainly I see um, building classroom recovery plan as ability to continue working with minimal or no interruption, definitely. And, uh, and I see the business continuity follows up with that. That's interesting to see um, how we're able to achieve uh, mini and, uh, and to minimize interruption throughout our facilities. Thanks. Next slide, please. So how do we how do we accomplish that? Let's go to our next slide. So um, when we focus on resiliency, I think it's extremely important to understand that a resilient plan is not a plan that is one sided. We need to look at pretty much all of our resources, all of our departments everyone, all the stakeholders, so we can be able to have a plan that works for all of us. So we have to look at all the users in terms of our facilities division, our education sector, our energy and sustainability teams, and all, and all the users and how they, they get impacted. So it has to be a, a very thought, very well thought uh, plan. In terms of, uh, we as a district, we have what we call the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center. And it's, it's a center that responds when we have certain emergencies. But those responses to address certain issues and items. So for us, we have to be thinking on a whole different 
uh, context. We have to be thinking, you know, how do, how do we get our resources back to work? Do we have a, what we call a business continuity plan or some kind of a planning in place to, be, to identify how we're gonna be able to move forward and continue our operations? In terms of design, how are designs building? Do we have uh, a zero net energy policy? Our buildings, can they recover quickly and can they be pre prepared to give back for our students? So we have to be thinking of renewables. Do we have any renewable infrastructure? And then um, again, how, how quickly can we respond to bring those facilities back in operation? Next slide, please. So um, in terms of the uh, uh, business continuity plan, here at LA Unified, we have a plan and it became very helpful with the, less, with the last pandemic that we have. Um, certainly nobody thought that we we're gonna have this kind of emergency, but we did. And certainly we were prepared for it in terms of having a business continuity plan that helped us. Thing is in, in terms of how to respond, how we get our resources to continue the work that we do. And I'm, and I'm referring to the different teams within energy sustainability, within the facilities team and throughout. So that plan identifies um, certain elements to be able to get everyone back to operations. And certainly it has a site relocation plan and uh, tells us in terms of where do we meet? Where do we continue our operation? What, where is the location? It has a business impact analysis plan and that plan is more about identifying essential functions and what are these functions and how we can able to relocate those functions. So we have a, a continuous operation um, it's, uh, when we have certain events like this. And then uh, how do we recover? What kind of things do we have in place <clears throat> that we have to be able to, to recover from this incident? So this plan was very helpful as we were able to communicate between our teams and we're able to quickly get back in business. Certainly what was very helpful on the last pandemic for us, it was that we have, um, were able to get and have remote access from our computers to be able to have our files our technology within a specific location or we're, built, we're able to access it and continue our operations. But then how about our buildings? How is our buildings going to continue function? How they will respond in terms of our emergency? And there's different types of emergencies. I've talked about the pandemic, but how about if we have an earthquake? How about if we have a fire? Again, it may be a little different for, for each area, but a lot of the things that we have to be careful about and plan for is things that I think that can help us regardless in any kind of those events. So we need to understand our buildings and certainly working with the Department of Energy, Energy and setting up some goals and guidelines helped us um, get into a deeper thought of understanding how we can be able to respond back to our buildings. Next slide, please. And how we're able to benchmark and understand how we can be able to respond if we develop uh, you know, healthier buildings, safer buildings, buildings that um, the maintenance, it's, uh, it's ready and can respond to it. How we can be able to have, again, some of these emergency plans, how we can respond back to these emergencies. Next slide, please. So one of the things that helped us in terms of facilities is the, uh, is the ability uh, to start thinking about zero net energy and how we can make our buildings zero net energy. And why is that? It's because when you have buildings that you can continue operations, let's say if you have a, a power disruption because of uh, high winds, or if you have any kind of uh, disruptions, you can, you can be able to respond quickly um, and by having uh, at least facilities that can be able to come back into operations in very minimal time. So is the ZE um, uh, process that we went through, and I, I wanna compliment the DOA and the, and the NREL teams, was very helpful to help us start getting our buildings to become ZNE ready or ZNE buildings moving to the future. And certainly one of the tools that was very helpful to us, it was the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. And I know that I uh, know one of the panel speakers will be getting more detail about Energy Star, but looking at Energy Star and the benefits that we can have about en with Energy Star, I think can greatly gets us to understand our buildings better, being able to uh, sustain and bring our buildings back into operation a lot better. So um, here's a formula that shows how we get into zero energy. I think everyone is very familiar with this, but we, we certainly start with education awareness um, and being able to get our, the users to understand how the, the building is functioning to be able to conserve, conserve as much as we can, get into energy efficiency, efficiency and then introduce renewables to be able to get us there. And certainly there's a lot of 
different ideas and concepts in terms of how do you do that, um, of having different sources to get you there. To the next slide, please. So um, emerging technologies is extremely important for us and uh, attending these events, it's very helpful because we learn about what's the latest technologies out there. We're testing over, I would say um, about 15, 20 new technologies currently and our team is trying to learn what's the latest and greatest so we can make our buildings more efficient and be able to take us to the next step, which is um, zero net energy buildings by the introduction of batteries, solar storage, um, introducing even, even uh, in, depending on the location, um, we're doing mapping to understand what location of our buildings and how they're gonna get impacted in terms of earthquakes, in terms of fires. So we can be able to even have for now emergency generators until we get our buildings to respond um, to these emergencies within 24 hours. And certainly microgrid is a great concept that we're applying on some of our school facilities. Next slide, please. So a quick uh, uh, question again, um, do you have a resiliency plan? Uh, what is holding you back? So let's just do this poll and see where you are and what, what would it take to get there? So it's interesting to see if any of you have some kind of a plan in place for your school districts. And um, wow, so I, I'm seeing 100%, uh, everyone is having a resiliency plan, which is great. Um, some of them certainly wanna learn how they start and where do they start. Um, great questions. Um, and I think um, uh, it's interesting to see um, that you a lot of you are, are in development and you're planning to develop such a plan. And for those who have a plan, it's interesting to share also at least what you learn and hopefully out of this presentation, you're learning something perhaps different um, that can put in place. And I hope to learn something as well that we can apply. Uh, let's go to the next poll, please. So I've seen that, let's, yeah, let's go to the next slide. I see that we have, there's a lot of them that there's no plan development in place. And it's interesting that we think about having such a plan in place. Um, it's not that difficult, it's not very complicated. Again, uh, I think we show kind of some kind of a formula of how you start here by engaging uh, all the stakeholders into the place. But um, while we're moving our sustainability teams and, and you can keep advancing the slides here real quick because I, I just wanted to show some highlights in terms of the work that we do it's important to see the accomplishments that we we're making as we move forward between all the six focus areas that we have, because all these areas that you're seeing here really have an impact on our sustainability and resiliency plan. Because when we make our schools to be high performing schools, when we uh, when we engaging our students in the process and understand our facilities, when we're able to, to install uh, new technologies like solar, for example, and be able to be able to, to decrease uh, our dependency on utility companies because of the installation of microgrids. Uh, when we develop um, gardens or, or learning environments outside that our students can be on outside and still continue their uh, learning. All those things are, I think, great uh, to get us to the next level, which is uh, having sustainable and eventually resilient facilities that can be able to respond to these adverse uh, uh, impacts or effects that we have. Next slide, please. So um, I will continue our target goals. You know, I talked about the 2024. Certainly we have a big target of 2030, which is 100% renewable energy. It's easier said than done, but I know we have the talent, the team to lead us there. And by 2040 to become a carbon free district. So I'm looking forward to those accomplishments. And certainly when we look at the bottom line, when we uh, have a pathway towards sustainability and resiliency, we can see the savings. And all these savings in terms of energy, water, and everything, that we, everything else that we have, so monies that we can put, put back in the classroom. So I'm very fortunate to show some of these numbers and these accomplishments. And, um, and I hope I get to inspire you to have your own plan for uh, you know, continue your efforts and, and eventually having your sustainability and resiliency plan in place. Next slide, please. And I, and I wanna leave you with a, with a quote by Benjamin Disraeli, which I think is very important. And he says that I'm prepared for the worst, but I hope for the best. With that, uh, Nate, thank you. And for the rest of the team for the opportunity to present on resilience.
Thank you so much, Christos. That's wonderful. I'm going to suggest we keep moving right along in the interest of time. Uh, but I would say please reach out to Christos if you have questions through the email address there, but also to us. Uh, in the WIP office, we have developed and are actively developing, in fact, a series of tools to support resiliency planning. Uh, our colleagues at FEMP have additional ones that I've heard directly from school district partners uh, that they are finding useful. So we don't necessarily have time in this session to go into depth on those uh, resources, but they exist and we want you to reach out and ask questions about them. We're here for you to help. So let's build on uh, the subject of resiliency uh, with the next presentation, if we can keep going to the next slide with Paul Torsellini, uh, who is going to share some of the latest and greatest research uh, that has been identified as a top priority for both sectors um, around zero energy buildings, specifically schools. So Paul, I'm gonna pass to you. And following your presentation, uh, my colleague Hannah is going to take over transitions and q and I'm actually gonna hop off to go over to the local government meetup. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly say thank you to everyone for joining. And I'm looking forward to the follow-up and working with all of you in the time ahead and keep submitting questions and ideas over Slido. That is what we're gonna use to uh, make sure this session is interactive right into the last minute. Paul, go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks Nate and, and thanks for facilitating this and providing leadership around uh, Zero Energy Schools over uh, uh, the last couple of years. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, so I wanna first highlight our advanced energy design guides. Nate had uh, mentioned that I have uh, facilitated a lot of this process and NREL has performed a lot of the analytical support for this. Um, we published a K-12 uh, guide a couple years ago, um, but I also want to highlight, and, and it was specific to K-12 schools, provides a UI guidance for that, but I also want to bring out that um, about a year ago, we put out a guide for offices, and we're currently working on multifamily, uh, and that guide is expected to be out in the fall. Um, even though these have very specific topics, I want to point out, especially for um, the higher education part of our audience today, that there's a lot of overlap. And so I've identified some specific space types that each of these guides has really tried to emphasize. Um, and really, it's they're put together to get us to very aggressive uh, EUI targets. So next slide. And so just a little background on this, uh, we started off with a set of 30% guides uh, that were published in the mid 2000s and then moved to 50% guides um, where we expanded the different building types. And we were looking at a 50% savings from ASHRAE 90.1 2004 to where we are today to having two zero energy guides published uh, and then the multifamily coming. Uh, Nate had mentioned kind of the number of downloads between all of the guides. Um, we're just shy of 680,000 um, being released, um, both electronically and in print version. Um, and so you can see the stats there on the screen. These are about a month old uh, at this point. Uh, the guides are available as a free download off of ASHRAE's website. Uh, next slide. And so a little bit about them, uh, they really were set up to uh, mesh kind of a team of industry experts that makes up the project committee that puts these together uh, with a number of case studies that show that low EUIs are possible and these buildings are operated. And then uh, NREL has provided uh, technical support for the series of zero energy guides to show different kinds of packages and what EUIs are achievable in the different climate zones. Um, and like I said, uh, this number is a little out of date, but we're getting very close to 680,000 in distribution. Next slide. Um, so moving along, one of the things that we heard uh, in putting that together as well, and really the audience for a lot of those design guides um, are architects and engineers. They're really very design focused. Um, but one of the things that we were hearing was owners really liked the design guides, if nothing else, to hold it up and say, I want one of these. Um, and I want to be able to achieve those kinds of EUI targets for my buildings. Um, and what is that mechanism for really making that happen? And, and what do owners need to know? And so Nate had mentioned our Zero Energy Schools program, um, looking through the attendee list. Uh, there were several, there's several people on the attendee list that helped put these together. And we spent a couple of years 
with monthly webinars and phone calls and other information gathering interviews uh, to really understand what some of the barriers were. And I, and I see you know, from the barriers list before that they are still very much on the top of people's minds on what those barriers are. And they range from cost to, I just don't know how to ask the right questions. And so we put a lot of these owner perspective ideas and comments and uh, some of those solutions together in a guide that came out last summer. Uh, the URL for that guide is there. It's available off of Venrel's website. Uh, but really how to get to zero and, and what are some of the challenges? Um, yes, it was put together by um, lots of people involved in schools. But as we've studied other sectors and as uh, we've worked on other sectors for zero energy guidance, there's a lot of parallels to other building types uh, that we hear the same kinds of barriers over and over again. And this guide is a good start to help us get there. Uh, next. And so, you know, some of the questions that come up is really about knowledge. You know, how do I know, I might not know the information, I might not need to know what the answer is, but a lot of times it's how do you ask the right questions? How do you um, hire the right AE team that knows how to solve these problems? Um, one that comes up often is around cost. And so, and I saw that again a little bit earlier when uh, you were entering information, it will cost too much and there's this concern that you don't wanna go down a road that you really can't afford. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with, it's hard to be first, um, that this concept of a building producing as much energy as it consumes is really a, a, a relatively new idea and it's really a paradigm shift from how buildings operate. Um, and so it, it is really hard to be first. And then there's all these other competing priorities. I, I forgot to mention and, and Christo's presentation reminded me earlier but one of the things that we started doing with the office design guide, it's not in the K-12 one, is showing where there's parallels to other things. So where does energy efficiency help with resiliency? Where does energy efficiency, how can you go through strategies that you can actually save money in capital cost uh, while designing around zero energy concepts? And so putting all those pieces together is one thing that we've been looking at. But at the end of the day, it is really hard to be one of the first um, kind of a, a leader in this field and putting these together. And so as a result, Nate and I have spent a lot of time over the last year uh, looking to collect uh, information around cost and energy performance of a lot of these K-12 schools. And so, you know, things like if I know where the school is and its location, what its cost is and what its EUI is, we've been gathering this information up um, and actually putting it together to help address some of these barriers. And at the end of the day, one of the things we're finding is that there are lots of people building these buildings that are have very good EUI goals. Uh, go to the next slide. And when I say a good EUI goal, that's really in this range of 20 to 25,000 BTUs per square foot. And so here you can see a number of projects where a vast majority of them are coming in at less than 30. Um, and just in perspective, code is somewhere in probably the low 40s today uh, for energy performance, 40,000 BTUs per square foot. But there are lots of buildings coming in in this 20 to 25 range. In fact, it was the highest mark on this graph. And in fact, there's some that are coming in even lower than that. Um, and so design teams are gaining experience. And one of the things we're finding is, is that the more design teams have worked in this, the better the energy performance is getting. Um, and we can actually track uh, with some of our um, AE partners um, how their performance is improving with time. And so um, we are building these zero energy schools and it is happening today and that you no longer need to kind of be out on the edge to make it happen. Uh, next slide. And then just to kind of put it uh, into total perspective here, those EUIs can also translate to project costs. These are dollars per square foot. Uh, and again, you can see a lot of buildings in that 20 to 30,000 range. And they are, for the most part, lumped in kind of this 200 to $400 a square foot. Um, these have been normalized, uh, both date normalized and location normalized. There are outliers out there. 
And there are people building expensive buildings uh, for whatever reason, um, you know, and desire maybe those kinds of amenities. Uh, and there are also people that are building school buildings that have very high EUIs at the end of the day uh, for those same costs. And so we are up to about 150 schools that are being represented, both new and retrofit. Always happy to add to that list. Uh, but there are many schools operating in what we call this zero energy ready range that meet the targets that we laid out in the advanced energy design guides. Um, it does tend to be that newer schools have lower energy um, use and we're not seeing much evidence that zero energy ready needs to cost more, um, that it is possible to build it with uh, conventional budgets. Uh, next slide. Um, we are capturing a lot of this information and different resources um, and putting them onto a website called zeroenergy.org and you can learn about some of the outcomes from the accelerators that Nate and I had mentioned uh, on this website. There's also some other resources like a video that just explains what zero energy is and, and what that balance really means. Uh, and those videos are very useful uh, to educate a wide uh, audience range. Uh, next slide. One of my favorite parts of that is that there is a uh, video on there that talks about Discovery Elementary School and it's kind of a virtual tour of one of the earlier zero energy schools that are out there. So with that, uh, we can pass it off to Brendan and thanks for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, as Nate mentioned, my name is Hannah Debelius and I'm, I'm popping in here for moderation. I work with the higher education sector. Um, just a quick housekeeping note before we go to Brendan, which is that um, we are using Slido for the, the questions. So if you can go to slido.com to input the questions for the education meetup, that would be great so we can have it all in one place when we, when we get to that. Excellent. Paul, thank you again so much for sharing that wonderful resource. And I, um, it's wonderful to hear about all those examples as well. Discovery Elementary School in particular is great. I've had the opportunity to go. Um, next, we're going to hear from Brendan Hall, who's a program manager with Energy Star over at the US EPA and works with higher ed. So Brendan, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Hannah. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. Um, so I think we're going to start off here with a poll really quick um, in Slido. See if we can get that queued up. Um, so I'll fill you in on why I'm asking this in a minute, <laughs> but uh, it's multi-select. So um, feel free to answer too if you're not on the higher ed side. I feel like a lot of these challenges are sort of universal. And um, while waiting for results to come in. I, I just want to echo the previous thank yous to DOE for inviting me on. Um, it's, it's really great to be able to work um, in a healthy way with, um, with our partners in this space and DOE's uh, a great one on that front. Um, okay, so looks like some high point getters are um, well, there's a lot of high point getters, um, but limited staff, competing priorities, budget, and deferred maintenance are some of the top ones. Um, all right, Th thanks for filling that out. We can go on to the next one, please. All right, um, so I wanted to mention really early on um, sort of our shared goal um, and I'm thinking about both, you know, DOE and EPA, but then also I assume, um, based on the earlier responses, just about everybody who's here today. Um, so this is a little bit older of a analysis that was done, um, but just using it for um, purposes of magnitude. Um, essentially, it's showing that the, the, um, emissions uh, from colleges and universities, about 72% of that um, is based on what's generated and purchased, um, energy that's generated and purchased for use in buildings. Um, so obviously that's um, a big deal, not something just to, to write off and, um, and a, a key focus for us. 
So you go to the next slide, please. So hopefully many of you or all of you are aware of the Energy Star program. Um, I'm in my fifth year with the program and um, as Nate graciously <laughs> mentioned earlier in my intro, um, I do both uh, higher ed as well as support along with a colleague, our state and local governments across the country. Um, but our program um, really exists to try and um, promote energy efficiency um, in organizations. And um, we do that through a few different ways. So these are sort of high level um, program approach bullets here. Um, so one of the ways we do that is through a leadership commitment. Um, we ask folks to sign up, organizations to sign up as Energy Star partners and require that um, an executive sort of be a part, be party to that commitment. So um, our program really starts with that sort of top-down commitment to efficiency, um, especially from, you know, we're, we're a mature program. So um, over time, we've, we've sort of seen our ranks grow. Um, then we um, fill in the gap um, with tools and resources to help organizations try and understand their building energy use and act on it. Um, so a couple key um, tools and resources that, um, that we offer include Portfolio Manager, which is our sort of flagship tool for benchmarking, um, which includes 1 to 100 Energy Star scores and the ability to certify through the tool. Um, and then the last sort of bullet here is on recognition. So we start with this leadership commitment to efficiency and then we offer tools and resources to understand and act on energy use. And then the last thing we do is we, we try and recognize the top performers. So both at a building level through Energy Star certification and um, through our Energy Star awards, which are organization wide recognition for energy management. Um, and that's an annual recognition. So that's sort of at a, in a nutshell how our, how our program works. Next slide, please. So this um, sort of relates back to the poll question um, that I asked earlier. Uh, in my role here, we've, um, along with the contractor that supports our work, we've um, tried to sort of understand what are the key barriers that are in the way to efficiency, and then try and figure out what, you know, true to our program, what are some of the tools and resources that we can create and disseminate to help people get over those. So from an operational standpoint, um, you know, some of the ones we called up before, um, from a higher ed side, having limited staff often who are responsible for multiple um, sort of areas of expertise on campus. Um, of course, budget is always a, a challenge when you're talking about making big capital investments in a lot of cases on, um, technologies and um, also just deferred maintenance. You know, we have um, a, a lot of buildings, a lot of older buildings that, that need upgrades, but then also a pinch where there's been a lot of new construction lately. Um, uh, I feel like that's starting to taper off, student body is starting to taper off in terms of growth, but um, there's, there's this deferred maintenance backlog and um, that coupled with a budget shortfall makes for a lot of challenges. So that's the, some of the key operational barriers we recognize. And then on the data and benchmarking side, um, there are some, some challenges that sort of relate to our program and how we work. So um, our program really is built around understanding a building's energy performance and in higher ed because of um, building level metering being incomplete. Um, that sort of is one barrier to understanding a, uh, how a building is performing and also to get the most out of benchmarking and portfolio manager. Um, there's also incomplete coverage of 1 to 100 Energy Star scores in higher ed, uh, which is a challenge. We're always trying to figure out how we could get over that um, challenge through a, a survey, but um, haven't been able to get there yet. Um, so that's, that's tough as one of the key offerings to not 
to not be able to have that sort of across the board. And then there are just challenges around setting an accurate peer group um, for comparison. So most institutions do have sort of unique characteristics and that can make it tough to say, you know, I'm going to compare with schools, say, in my um, athletic conference or schools of the same size or schools in the same Carnegie classification or um, whatnot. So all those are challenges to sort of um, improving efficiency and also um, reducing GHG emissions, which is, um, again, sort of our program's main goal. I think in the higher ed space, one of the key um, key goals, especially like through the carbon and climate commitments and um, along with saving money, of course. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to highlight a, a few of the resources we've developed thus far, as well as some ones that we have in development and are considering um, this year. And um, I encourage you, um, if you represent a college or university, um, to reach out and if we're not already working together, if you're interested in any of these or have thoughts on other resources that would be helpful. So um, in the first category, the things that we've completed. So last year we put out a guide on um, six leading tools that are online sustainability tracking tools. Um, and it's really meant to try and offer some market clarification around what the different tools out there do and how they connect and don't. Um, so it's a little agnostic as to which ones you're using. It's, it's really with the understanding that, again, these staff have a lot of things that they're doing um, and sort of limited capacity to do them. And um, we're trying to make it as easy as possible to understand the options out there and reduce um, extra burden. So um, check that out if you're interested, please. Um, in development, we have a case study on Northwestern University, which is our sort of flagship um, winner. They won our Partner of the Year, um, that, that sort of organization-wide recognition I mentioned earlier in 2018 and 2019 for energy management. And then um, they're the first higher ed sustained excellence winner um, in 2020, which is sort of our highest level um, recognition for repeated um, evidence of, of savings and performance. Um, we also have an, what we're calling uh, an executive report, and that is looking at characteristics that are often seen as drivers of energy use on campus, like Carnegie classification, climate zone, percent residential, um, you know, amount of uh, intensive space, like lab space, and plotting that against campus level um, energy use intensity values, um, and those are in site energy use. And um, what we're finding with that plotting is that a lot of the relationships really are weaker. Um, so while we might have thought that um, going in that there'd be sort of a clear relationship, in fact, we're seeing that um, there isn't that strong a one and, and sort of conjecturing that what's what's not there is um, energy management as you know, basically from one institution to the next, there are very different levels of, um, of delivery on energy management. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a marketing piece, but also something that um, use, uses this data to, to tell a story. Um, and then sort of the big thing, and the reason I think I was brought on today, <laughs> um, and I'll eventually get to it, is a, a peer comparison opportunity. Um, and I'll talk more about that in the, in the next couple slides. And then a couple other things that um, we might have coming down the pike. So we're talking about a, a network, possible networking um, session for institutions that are subject to state and local ordinances. So in that way, I can sort of um, use both of my uh, roles here at EPA and, and uh, cross both. Um, and then also, again, trying to look out for potential ways to develop um, scores and certification for higher ed. Next slide, please. And Brendan, if you could, we have about one more minute before we have to turn over to Rachel, just a heads sure. up. But of course, we also have your contact at the end if anyone needs to follow up. Thank you. Great, of course. Um, yeah, so I can zoom through this really quick. So, um, so Energy Star is launching a peer comparison opportunity. This is sort of our flagship offering um, in 2020. 
uh, obviously difficult times to be launching a new campaign and um, we hope that people can participate, but um, also understand if they can't, um, but please uh, check it out if, if you might be able to do it um, through it. We're really, um, we're gonna try and um, basically at a high level, what we're gonna be doing is asking folks to send us their energy use at a campus level and then also their floor area and then some other key characteristics like the ones I was talking about earlier, um, you know, the numbers for those. And then um, we'll share back an anonymized scorecard as well as overall results um, for participating institutions. So it's a really easy way, even for those who haven't benchmarked in Portfolio Manager before, to, um, to get back sort of a, a peer result on, on their performance. And then we're gonna use it hopefully as a springboard for our future effort, efforts like best practice sharing, um, multiple rounds, of, and we're hoping to offer multiple rounds with increasing participation and hopefully that will lead to a survey eventually. Um, and please reach out to me um, if you're interested. I think our contact info will be shared. Um, next slide please, and this is my last one. Um, so this is just a quick view of, of um, not actually, it's not actually what's gonna be, but a mock-up of what it might be. Um, so there's a, a timeline of the launch where we'll be having things open in July and August. And um, please reach out to me if you're, if you're interested. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brennan. You have a lot of great resources packed in there. And I know that, um, you know, peer comparison is such a, um, and benchmarking is such a great tool for, for everyone in higher ed. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, and now we're going to turn it over to uh, Rachel Romero. And actually, we can go to the next slide. It'll Perfect. Uh, Rachel Romero is an energy engineer and project leader at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And so she's gonna be talking to us a little bit about the SMART Lab tool. So over to you, Rachel. Great, we're doing, gonna do a quick poll question to start. Um, how familiar are you with SMART Labs? Um, and while people uh, fill that out in Slido, um, I'll define SMART Labs. Uh, so, um, smart labs look at safe and efficient high performance laboratories uh, and we're going to share with you some resources today for you to learn more about smart labs. I love the answers here. I'm eager to learn more and I'm a little bit familiar. Uh, these are great um, and maybe one or two partners in the room. So, all right, I am going to share my screen and give you a little bit of a demo of the toolkit. If you'd like to follow along, um, I'd encourage you to navigate to smartlabs.i2sl.org uh, and feel free to uh, check it out later as well. So uh, this is the Smart Labs Toolkit uh, website that was re recently launched. Um, the toolkit really helps organizations implement a Smart Labs program, so a very comprehensive uh, program really, by following distinct phases that uh, include specific tasks and resources that are proven to deliver high performance labs. Um, there's support efforts for key stakeholders and really maximize benefits for the organization. So I'm gonna walk you through a few of my favorite pieces of the Smart Labs Toolkit. Um, to get started on this front page, um, you'll notice that on the left side here, we do have an interactive directory. Um, and that's kind of how you navigate through the Smart Labs Toolkit. At the top of every page is our little logo and you can um, click that to get home at any time. So uh, we love this graphic. This is a simulated lab, um, but if you click on these little icons, the yellow dots, um, you can navigate around and learn about different parts of what is a smart lab. Um, so here's an example. Smart labs have engaged scientists that know about sustainability. They understand green chemistry and they know how to reduce their hazardous chemical use in certain ways. Um, high performance fume hoods. So uh, I encourage you to explore this. It, if uh, we weren't on the Zoom meeting, it'd probably load a little faster. Um, but you can uh, go around and see the different parts and pieces of a smart lab. 
We do define what a smart lab is here as well, um, really enabling world-class science through high performance methods. And we list those methods out. It's really containing the exposure, putting ventilation in the right place at the right time, using controls and overseeing all of that. So um, there are four main steps for smart labs that we're gonna look at today plan, assess, optimize, and manage. So I'm, um, oh, we're gonna go through those, but there's a quick introduction. I'll point to this video on the introduction page. Um, if you have somebody who's just learning about Smart Labs or uh, wants a brief introduction, this video is great for that. So now we're gonna move to plan. Plan is the first phase in the Smart Labs toolkit. And planning really um, is where you, you're coordinating your team, you're doing some testing, and you're getting prepared to look at your laboratories. Um, this is a great example of putting your team together. This is uh, what a Smart Labs program really looks like. You'll see at the center, at the bottom, we have the Smart Labs coordinator. Um, this person is often called a champion, but this coordinator is uh, pushing the program forward and they bring on a core team that could include uh, EHS to ensure safety facilities who's already doing some of the work um, sustainability staff a specific person that works on ventilation and we always recommend management so um, very important graphic uh, also in the plan phase you're going to be um, each of the uh, smart, uh, each of the phases has a deliverable at the end. And for the plan phase, it's a Smart Labs roadmap. And this roadmap, we provide a template here at this link for you to get started. Several of our Smart Labs Accelerator partners have used this. Um, so uh, fill out what you can, and that is a great guide to share with management on what you're going to do for your Smart Labs program. So we'll keep moving right on. Um, I encourage you to come back and explore. So each lab presents unique hazards. So the assessment phase really looks at um, what's different for each. So after you develop the plan, you move into this in-depth assessment of the labs. And this is where you conduct a laboratory ventilation risk assessment. Um, this is where you assign risk levels based on the chemical types that's being used in the lab, how much of it is being used, and kind of the usage rate. Um, and you look at this for both general exhaust and in exposure control devices or fume hoods. So the output of this process in the assessment phase is a risk control band to operate the lab within. Um, for example, you may find that your risk control band is four to six air changes. Uh, it may be uh, somewhere else. And so really assessing what you need is where uh, you wanna do that. We do have um, our Smart Lab Accelerator partners uh, participated in case studies and they are linked throughout the Smart Labs toolkit. So moving on, if I can navigate around this screen share. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's the kind of risk banding that I was discussing um, also on assess page. So uh, check that out. That's very comprehensive in that. The share thing is in the wrong place. Okay. <laughs> Next, you want to optimize uh, your facilities. So this is really where you're making projects happen. Um, and so when you're optimizing, uh, you're gonna need funding. And so we have a, a good piece on funding. Uh, you're gonna develop a scope of work. So we have some information on that. And then um, some partner case studies on how they optimize their space. Finally, you wanna manage your laboratories. And uh, laboratories need constant management. Um, research is changing. Uh, very quickly these days. And so you want to be able to keep up with that. And, and so how do you manage change at the laboratory level? And we have some information to help out with that. Uh, 
we have lessons learned for, um, you really wanna use your lessons learned for implementing change across your campus after you've done a building as well. So moving on, we also have a piece about working with scientists. Um, your occupants are really, really important uh, in this space because they're the driver of a lot of change and information. So when you're thinking about implementing a Smart Labs program, it's important to know the research and the occupants in that space. And um, research safety is really important. Uh, we've worked with the ambassador program with Miley Green Labs um, to provide a resource to facilitate engaging scientists of labs. Um, this program really educates scientists on ways they can reduce the impact of their research in energy, waste, water, green chemistry, and their procurement of their items. So you can use the ambassador program to initiate a Smart Labs program by really inspiring scientists to change their behavior or support existing efforts by educating scientists on concrete actions they can take. So that training is available. You can see one of the videos here. Uh, it's now available on the My Green Labs website and is linked from this page. So the uh, Smart Labs Toolkit is very process oriented. We did want to share that we have a new, um, added a new piece to the HVAC resource map. This is very specifically for laboratories. The HVAC resource map is an excellent resource for looking at um, systems. Um, so we have the central plant, the distribution system, all the way down to the zone level. And this interactive map that you can see uh, down here looks like a laboratory, uh, goes through various technologies that are very specific to laboratories and the ventilation system. So I encourage you, if you're looking for technology solutions, the HVAC resource map, which is linked through the Smart Labs Toolkit is a great resource. So with that, um, I'd be ex uh, excited to see your questions on Slido and hear what you need to get started in your Smart Labs program today. Thanks, Hannah. Excellent, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I had a wonderful opportunity to go to a Smart Labs event at UC Irvine, and so it's just such a, such a great tool. Um, as you all can see, we have just a couple of minutes left, and so um, although we're only gonna get to probably one question here, I did my best to combine some of the questions we have on Slido, and so it'll be for each of our panelists, but because of our time constraint, if our panelists can answer with just one quick, you know, like 10 to 15 second sound bite, that would be great. So combining some of these, I feel like a, a question we have here is, you know, Better Buildings really focuses on rec replicability of great solutions. So given the things that you talked about in your um, time for each of our panelists, how could you translate one tool or resource that you talked about um, in order to prove that value to leadership? So, so many people on the line are bought into what you're talking about, but need to make that case. So how can we translate that? And especially given this time right now where we're looking to reoccupy buildings or with existing buildings. Um, so does any of our panelists wanna start with just a quick answer on that? So I guess I can, I can jump in here for a minute. Um, so some of it is, and one of the things that I have found working is that if you can be convinced, especially on the facility side, that there really is not additional cost, and I'm gonna start with new construction, there is no reason not to put EUI goals, even if they're aspirational in every procurement document you send out about buildings. Um, and with the assumption that it's not gonna raise costs, what we're finding is there are more and more design teams that are willing to take on that challenge and deliver buildings at your fixed budget or your typical budget, but also meet those energy goals. Um, and so I think that that's a good starting point for it. On the renovation side, you know, there's a lot of similarities there, um, you know, depending on how large that renovation is um, to whether or not you can also achieve that. But even just getting the design teams, getting the professionals in that know how to 
um, ask those questions and are, who are committed to making those design decisions to help save energy along the way without increasing the cost. That is a critical first step. Um, I think it's also trying to figure out pathways to get there. I know there were some questions on decarbonization, but um, you know, what are those steps? So like if you're replacing a heating system, don't replace it with another steam heating system that would be very hard to electrify and hard to maintain that infrastructure. Replace it with a system that can handle 120 to 130 degree water instead. Um, because then you're creating pathways to moving towards the future and not being kind of stuck in what the old systems were. So, yeah. Just a, a quick just... response from other panelists. It looks like Rachel and then we'll hit uh, Christos. So for labs, um, I know a lot of campuses may be wanting to get the researchers back in. Um, smart labs proves safety with the lab ventilation risk assessment. So if you're mm -hmm. concerned about that, the smart labs program can help evaluate and really look and ensure safety and then you get energy efficiency and other benefits from that uh, but the primary goal is to ensure safety so yeah great point thanks rachel christos uh, want to weigh in on that quickly yes and i wanted to add with, to what paul was saying 100 uh, percent agree is that we have to look at actually uh, take a collaborative approach between design um, and other stakeholders and then try to change some of the standards uh, in terms of our design guidelines and specifications, when we're replacing an existing system, and we're, and we're saying as a as a district, we're gonna become uh, we're gonna decarbonize the next 10, 20 years. I mean, some of those systems they're gonna become obsolete. What we're using today, through innovation, um, in five, 10 years from now, they're gonna become obsolete. So have a plan when you replace existing systems, replace them with new. And when you replace it with those new systems, you're gonna find out that a lot of the systems, they specifically a lot of the electric systems a lot more efficient as we move forward. So that could be a plan moving forward. And also again, collaboration and educating all the stakeholders so they can understand the benefits of achieving those goals. Awesome, Christos, thank you so much. And um, John, if we could uh, pop back over to the slides, that would be wonderful. I just wanna wrap up here. Um, I know we're, we're a minute or two over, but I just wanna remind you all that um, all of the resources that we referenced today and so many more are available in the Solutions Center, which you can check out anytime. And you also have many opportunities this summer to join us for uh, more resources and, and education. Our Better Building Summer, uh, summer <laughs> webinar series starts in July and covers tons of best practices and really relevant topics. So I hope that you'll register for those over in the Better Building Solution Center um, when you look at the 2019-2020 webinar series. And finally, I just wanna say another huge thank you to all of our panelists today. We really appreciate you being online and um, we really also appreciate you sharing your contact information with us. There were so many questions on Slido that we didn't get to today. so. Um, I hope you all reach out and, and thank you so much for your expertise and for everyone joining us today for uh, this virtual education meetup.